start things off with a clip. So the thing I would say is when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, that, that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it. Um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, the, this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better, because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. So uh, last year I had to give a speech before um, the event. Who the black train? Um, last year I had to give a speech before the event, and in the speech I uh, I actually read the text of. The uh, sit down of the ad, the ad copy that's up on the floor of the Apple ad, um, and last year's theme was "Here's to the Crazy One." And as I'm practicing the speech, every time that I would read the same line, I would get emotional, and I would literally get like teary-eyed. And the line that that got me is the one that's highlighted up. And it's, they, they push the human race forward. They even got a little goosebumps now. Um, and the, the reason why, um, can close the, door? the reason why that line got me so much is because I think, I think it's, it's a mandate. And I think that if we, as we established last year, buy in that we are the group that is crazy enough to think that they can change the world and have this sort of impact, um, then our job is to push the human race forward. And in that sense, it's an incredibly noble calling. Um, the difference between last year and this year is last year it's about understanding that. This year it's about understanding that our time to actually do that is now. And we have to actualize some of these things that we've been talking about wanting to do and actually having an impact and influencing. We all have different skill sets. We've all been dealt a different genetic hand um, in terms of what we're good at. We've all been dealt different likes, different interests, different passions. Um, we've all been dealt different weaknesses. Uh, certain things come easy to us, certain things come a bit harder um, and are a little bit more difficult. And at the same time, we've also had different experiences, uh, different family lives, grown up in different parts of the country, uh, different life experiences, some less life experiences, some more life experiences. Um, but all of that doesn't matter. Uh, when we come together towards the same mandate of pushing the human race forward. I had, when I worked at uh, Goldman Sachs, I was probably 
23 years old when um, I had to, uh, 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 any investment bank, a big part of it is the summer analyst program and the summer associate program where they go and they recruit at schools and uh, business schools and they bring in people for the summer and they try them out and then they either offer them a job or not. And I had, we had two analysts in my office that I was uh, responsible for. And we had a, a woman named Linda Liu and a guy named Lou DeRose, so they were the Lou's. Uh, <laughs> and the first day, I sat them down, and they're probably 20, and I said, uh, Linda, your success or failure is Lou's success or failure. Lou, your success or failure is Linda's success or failure. Um, your job is to work together and help each other out to improve. And I can't describe the, the, the weight that was lifted off of their faces just by hearing that, that they weren't in competition with one another because that happens a lot, especially in the financial world. It happens in the legal world. It happens at a lot of businesses. I think it happened a lot last night on the uh, racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the, 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 the weight that was lifted once they realized that they had a collective responsibility to work together, uh, I'll, I'll definitely never forget. And this last year I read um, a book by Mike Krzyzewski, <clears throat> also known as Coach K. He's the coach at Duke, the basketball um, powerhouse in North Carolina. And he, he poses an interesting uh, question to his players that I'll do the same for you. And it's, what if I told you you could not experience personal failure? See, when you have a mutual commitment to each other and you're striving towards a collective goal, it's impossible for any one person to fail. You might make a mistake. You might drop the ball in the literal sense on a basketball court, but your desire and your passion and your effort is working towards that collective goal. So no one person is directly responsible for that group's success or failure. One thing that um, Dave said in his presentation was that what he looks for most, and I forget if he said this about editors or about writers, but it doesn't matter, is improvement. And I agree. Improvement is what's called a tell. It's an indicator of wanting to get a little bit better, wanting to improve a little bit more for the group, for the sake of the group. Now, the notion of team is used a lot in business, and I actually think it's used incorrectly. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that happened at Goldman Sachs that were not a team, uh, team focused. There are a lot of things that were, um, but every business, or a lot of businesses use that, use that word, use that buzzword. Um, but, I, and I use it too, and I wanna explain it. And there's a reason why I address all emails team as opposed to something else. Because I think it's important. Uh, collective responsibility, that notion, only works if you're part of a team and you have that mutual commitment to each other. Um, the reverse can be negative. Uh, and we've all experienced it. It's called, in economics, the tragedy of the commons. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you an example where you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You're out to dinner, you're with a group of friends, let's say six or eight people. You got the one guy, he says, hey, let's get some, you know, let's, I'm waiting for food, let's get a martini. So he gets a martini. And uh, then he, he says, you know what, they have a great burrata here. I know it's $18, but I'm gonna start with the burrata. Then as you're digging through your arugula, arugula salad, he gets the, he gets the, uh, the, the filet. Looks great, by the way. And then finally, the place of the great creme brulee, he has that. And oh, by the way, he had two glasses of wine with dinner. The check comes, he says, so we should all split it even. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tragedy of the commons. It's not collective responsibility. It's 
taking advantage of the group. Now, another thing is that a team is not a family. And that's an important distinction, especially within a family business when you have family members here. And I want to explain the two key differentiating factors between a team and a family. A family, for the most part, you don't get to choose. You're given your family, whether you like it or not. Here, you chose, all of you, chose to apply to this job. You chose to interview. You chose to accept the position. You chose to come to work every day. I don't mean to get all dangerous minds on everybody, but you chose to be here today. That is a choice. <laughs> the other key differentiating factor is that you're, in a lot of ways, your love for your family is unconditional. You're going to love your family no matter what. Um, and I see it in my wife's work. The amount of abuse that a parent can inflict on a child, the child can sometimes still come back for love because of that, because that relationship is so strong. Now, the reason why a team is different is because that love and that respect for one another is conditional, and it should be. The, the respect and the, that commitment that I referred to should be earned and not just a given. You should want to prove yourself to somebody else. This morning, I get great material from my wife. This morning, I'm at a, I'm, I'm, I signed up for a six week boot camp at the gym Equinox. And you have to go three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, six to 7 a.m. for six weeks. And uh, we're, in this, we're in this boot camp, and as part of it, they have those, um, so picture, picture like, a, like a, rubber, uh, a rubber band with two, two handles on it. And what you do is you hook up with somebody else, and then you pull it, and it creates tension, okay? So the instructor says, find a partner. So we, we partner up. And uh, you know we're doing it. We're squatting down, and we're coming up, and we're, we're pulling, and we're squatting down. And she's giving me the, uh, you know, sort of the look, you know, and she does the, the trip forward like I'm, like I'm pulling her off of her feet. And I'm, I'm sort of getting frustrated. So, uh, so then in the next round, the teacher says, uh, find a new partner. I'm like, thank God. Uh, <laughs> the teacher told me to. <laughs> so, so I get hooked up with a, a woman who's probably 65. And I'm like, I, all I can do to keep up with her, you know, she's just, she's just a beast just going through this thing. And I look over at Allison, and she's with probably somebody in their 20s who's super fit, and Allison's given the <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, where was this person when you were doing this with me? <laughs> the difference is, with me, it was family. She knew I was going to you know, take care of her tonight. She knew I would accept her no matter what. The second, she had to be held accountable to a teammate, to somebody else, who was committed towards this six-week goal, she got her stuff together. <laughs> the people who are on the team are equally important to the concept of team itself. I was having lunch on Saturday with a friend of mine who actually works at his family's business. And he also um, went uh, the startup route at one point and then went back. And he was telling me about raising money uh, with venture capitalists. And th those are people who, who invest in small businesses and hope that they um, grow into, into large businesses. And he said, uh, I asked him sort of why his startup didn't work out. And he said, the team. And he said, these venture capitalists, they're not investing in your idea. They're investing in you. They're investing in the team. And I, I, I was sort of taken aback and I'm like, Here's guys who get business pitches all the time, and they're investing millions of dollars, sometimes tens of millions of dollars, <coughs> not in an idea, but in a group of people. 
just assuming that's going to succeed down the road. That's the power of a successful team. <clears throat> this summer, I was watching the Summer Olympics in London, and I heard something, and it, 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 it just, everything sort of, the, the stars aligned for me, and I said, this is what Create 2013 needs to be about. And it was three words. It's breathe, believe, battle. And I'm watching the, uh, I'm watching, I'm watching the uh, women's uh, beach volleyball. Okay, and it's a, it's a team of Misty May trainers and Carrie Walsh Jennings. And uh, for those of you who don't know, they won the, it's, it's, two, it's two women and it's beach volleyball. They won the gold medal in 2004 in Athens. They won the gold medal in 2008 in China. And they won the gold medal in 2012 in London. So over a 12 year period, they have three gold medals. Oh, by the way, in 04, they lost zero sets. So you have to win two out of three sets in order to win the match. In 08, they lost zero sets. In 2012, they lost one set. So over the course of a three Olympics, a 12 year period, if you include training leading up to 04, they lost a total of one set and zero matches and earned three gold medals. I was drawn to these people. They're also local from Long Beach, I think even Manhattan Beach. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I bought in. I would watch all their matches and I did it, I did it in 08 and I did it in 012. And what I loved about them was how they worked together as a team. And the two things that I noticed that make Misty May and Kerry Walsh different are one, they never chewed each other out. There was, n there was not an ounce of negativity going from one partner to another, ever. And you don't see that in team sports, and you don't see that in, in life a lot of times. I mean, just drive down the 405. Yeah. There's a lot of negativity out there. And especially when it's, when it's uh, uh, tense. The second thing, and their track record speaks to this, is that when the pressure was on and when a team started to crawl back, they stepped on the team's throat. They knew when they had to perform and they had that sort of killer instinct. And going back to what I said before of this being the year that we want to start performing. Our time is now. One of the, uh, as I was watching Misty May and Carrie Walsh, one of the sideline reporters talked about an interview that she did with Carrie, and she was quoting her coach. And they just repeated the same three words and, and, and saying and it was breathe, believe, battle, over and over during the match. And the way that it was explained um, was uh, the, the breathe component is to just relax to be in the moment, uh, have an awareness of what you're doing, awareness of what's going on around you. Uh, I read another basketball coach's book, I didn't think about this, uh, but I read Phil Jackson's book, Sacred Hoops, and he tells this, he tells this story, and he says, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Buddhist proverb. Two monks were traveling together in a heavy downpour and they came upon a beautiful woman in a silk kimono who was, travel who was having trouble crossing a muddy intersection. Come on, said the first monk to the woman, and he carried her with his arms to a dry spot. The second monk didn't say anything until much later. Then he couldn't contain himself anymore. We monks don't go near females, he said. Why did you do that? His, the monk that he was traveling with him replied, I left the woman back there. Are you still carrying her? <clears throat> I love that idea because of its imagery of physically 
holding on to whatever it is that we hold on from the past. It could be something that happened here. It could be something that somebody said. It could be a life circumstance that's happening outside. But as hard as it is, and I admit it's hard, the more that we can be in the moment and focus on what it is that we're doing, as opposed to carrying all of our baggage with us, it will help us move forward towards that co co uh, collective goal. The next one is uh, believe, to have faith that you can rise above anything. The, the four, I figured something out this last year. Uh, I figured out what the four most powerful words in the English language are. You know what they are? Um, yeah. <laughs> I believe in you. The I never read the book, but I saw the movie, uh, The Help. And there's a scene in the movie, I don't know if it's in the book, and uh, it's probably going to make editors skin crawl, but it's a, it's a, it's a young girl who, whose mom is out with her mom friends, and she's taken care of by the help. And her um, nanny says to her throughout the movie, uh, you is smart, you is kind, you is important. And she's essentially saying, I believe in you. And that kid obviously needed it, because if a parent runs off in this, in this story, you get some sense of, some sense of self-doubt. The, the older I get, the more I realize, I, I start to question kind of everything um, in terms of what I was told. And that, that's why I led with, this, with the clip that I did was because I, I'm starting to realize that a lot of the constructs that I just took as, as they were um, are just, you know, maybe it's somebody carrying their own baggage and, and dumping it on me, or maybe it's just uh, sort of inertia and in the way things were going. And one of the things that I had a professor that I really like um, in, in, in college, and he said something to me that I used to live by uh, and, and, or at least I didn't live by it, but I, I internalized it. And it was confidence leads to competence and not the other way around. And I said, oh, well, that makes sense. And the older I got, the more I realized I completely disagree with that. I think that confidence comes from somebody else tell, telling you that they believe in you. And I think that competence comes from hard work. And I think that confidence comes from competence. So for me, reflecting on that, I actually think it's the reverse. The, uh, and in fact, the unrelated, I was, in a, I was in a huge auditorium. I was with my dad and my sister. And somebody's giving a lecture. And the, the woman who's giving the lecture says, she, she's talking about, um, it, was, she's, it was a marketing presentation, and she's talking about beliefs and belief systems and stuff like that. And she's going around the crowd and, and asking people questions and cold calling, and she says, uh, what do you believe in? And she shoves the microphone in my face. <laughs> and this is like 1,000 people. And uh, I just, I mean, at that point, you either you know, crawl into your chair or <laughs> I don't even know what else you do. So I just, I just said the first thing that came to mind, and I just said, hard work. And it just came out. But I think that it's true. Because if you work hard towards building a level of competence, then the confidence comes. Along that same line, you have to have that belief. And you have to have somebody else believe in you. And you have to have that self-belief. Uh, it's 2013, so it's 30 years from 1983. In 1983, uh, the, the, this story has been told over and over again, so I won't tell it. But the uh, North Carolina State um, uh, basketball team led by coach Jim Valvano uh, won the NCAA tournament and kind of put March Madness on the, on the, on the map in a lot of ways. They just did an ESPN documentary about it. Um, it it's, it's been told over and over again. But I, I watched the documentary, and one thing that I thought was crazy is that the, the coach, Jim Valvano, uh, when he got there, 
he had the team practice cutting down the nets. <laughs> so when you win the, the national title, that one of the things that they do is they get a ladder and you cut down the nets as if you won. So he had the team, he said, all right guys, let's, we, gotta, we gotta practice this, you know, let's get the, let's get the ladder down here, okay, who's we're gonna go first. Now he did this when he first got there. They didn't win the title for four years. So one class of people had to do this for four years <laughs> until they actually won the title. And that was a Cinderella story. But what Valvano was trying to do is instill a belief in his team that they were good enough to get there and paint a picture uh, and a vision for when they did get there so that it wasn't so foreign to them. Uh, I, wish he was he I wish she were here, but she's not. Um, Kathy Kubo, for me, academically, was the first person that really believed in me. And when she, I'll never forget, it was, I was a freshman, she was my math tutor, and I was a freshman in high school. And uh, she said that, that we were applying for classes for sophomore year. And she said to me, uh, you know, I, I said, oh, like there are applications for honors geometry or something like that. And she said, she basically said, uh, you're going to apply and you should get in and you should be in that class. And I don't know why, but it wasn't until she said that, that I actually believed in that. Because until that point, I, I viewed myself as there's no way I could survive in that class. There's no way I could live there. Um, and it wasn't until that other person said, you can do this, that I got that confidence in myself. Uh, finally, battle. Uh, you have to be prepared to go for as long as it takes. Um, just because you deserve, I'm going to read this quote exactly. Just because you deserve something doesn't mean it's going to be given to you. Sometimes you have to go and take what's rightfully yours. And I think that that's something that a lot of times when you do work hard and you fall short, that's the worst thing in the world. It feels that way. The worst thing in the world is not trying. Um, but sometimes in order to get those results and actually take it to the next level, you have to go out and you have to take what's yours. Um, last night, I'm, I'm practicing a speech to, to my wife and um, she, she, well, I finished, and she, she said, oh, it's, it's, it's really good. And I said, uh, I said, no, nah, it's horrible. And, uh, and, and she's like, what, what are you talking about? And she's like, uh, well, did you read your speech from last year? And I said, yeah, I read it. It was horrible. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and she, we both sort of laughed at, at, at me um, because that's, that's my personality. I know that about myself. Like nothing's ever going to be good enough. Um, and that's what drives me to want to do a good job. But the, the, the point is I was going to continue to battle through and try to do the best that I could uh, today, even though it was hard and there was a ton of self-doubt uh, at that point. Finally, as part of the battle, is I want to introduce the notion of beast mode. <laughs> okay? Um, the, there was a film that was up for best picture called Beasts of the Southern Wild. And um, the, the, uh, the, the heroine of the film, Quavenzene Wallace, uh, what, she, she was nine and she's nominated for best actress. Um, and she plays a, a girl in the movie called, and her name is Hush Puppy. And uh, she, she lives in this super poor, the, the place is underwater, it's called the bathtub. It's outside of Louisiana um, and uh, or, or New Orleans, and um, uh, she, she experiences tremendous trauma, poverty, and, and no food, and even abuse, and, and all sorts of stuff. And it's about her her determination and the beast inside of this small child. Um, and I, I love kind of the message of that film. And seeing nine year old Quavenzene Wallace at the Oscars. Uh, and, and, and using the term beast so freely in that capacity made me think of the first time I heard about beast mode and what it was. And I want to show you a clip. Well, I'm about, as opposed to what the 
Saints have the ball. Oh, look at this hole. What a run. Pulse on Lynch. Still on his feet. He's dancing his way. Go to the sky. I got one time. We're going to break this down. The whole offensive line. Watch him cut it back. And you're going to see all kinds of people sprinting down the field to help him. He breaks the tackle of Shanley. Runs through Sharper. Runs through Adele. Runs through Jabari Greer. Get off me. <laughs> <laughs> is what's inside you that's gonna, uh, that, that you just feel is sort of in your blood and in your DNA and gonna explode if it doesn't get out and doesn't um, get manifested in some way, in a good way. Um, I, was sitting on a, I was sitting on a panel for uh, new, or sorry, for people interested in applying to Stanford Business School. And somebody asked a really good question. They raised their hand and they said, you know, I haven't cured cancer, I didn't have a parent die, I didn't start a company. I feel like I have no shot of getting in. And the woman who on the admissions uh, uh, committee said, we look for people who do ordinary things extraordinarily well. And I love that phrase because it really kind of simplified life in terms of the game plan of yes, we want to push the human race forward and that's our collective goal, and how do we do that? Now, the opposite is doing ordinary, thing, ordinary things extraordinarily poorly. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> as part of this boot camp thing, I, I, get up, <laughs> I get up at like 5.15 and uh, in order to, to get myself out of bed, I have to prepare the coffee maker the night before. So I, I get out of bed, I, I, I put it on, I go brush my teeth, I walk the dogs, and then I'm out the door. And um, the, the other night, <laughs> I was preparing, this was like Sunday night, I'm preparing the coffee maker, and I put it in, and then I hit brew, go, <laughs> walk away. <laughs> Seven minutes later, at 9.30 night on a Sunday, I'm a bottle of coffee. <laughs> so you can do ordinary things extraordinarily poorly as well. Um, I had a, I had a, when I was a freshman in college on the crew team, um, we were, you know, the easy thing to do is complain, especially when you're younger because <clears throat> you sort of don't know any better. I guess maybe it gets easier, or at least I find it does. And we were complaining about our equipment, the oars and the boats and stuff like that. And the captain, uh, who was a senior, said to us a, a great phrase. He said, it's not the carriage, it's the horses. Um, and we all sort of shut up and said, yeah, you're right, you know, it's, it's about us, it's about the people, it's about the team. And I'm, all, I'm doing a lot of reading this year. I'm also reading the, uh, the Art of War, which is a great book. It, it's totally misnamed. It's really not about war. Um, I mean, it is, but, uh, but it's got a lot of good life lessons. And he had this, uh, uh, he had this great line, which was, there are, there are no more than five musical notes. Yet the combinations of these five give rise to more melodies than can ever be heard. There are not more than five primary colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black. Yet in combination, they produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are not more than five cardinal tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, bitter. Yet combinations of them yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. So the idea isn't about uh, the, like the building's nice and 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 the computers are nice and 
um, and all that, but that's not what it's about. It's really about the team. It's not about the idea, and that's why this keynote isn't about my ideas or what I think we should be doing. I will get to that, but it's really about the team and getting us on the same page to have that um, mutual commitment towards that collective goal, towards each other, and hold ourselves accountable. And accountability is the critical component. Think back to the tragedy of the comet. That guy's not holding himself accountable when he wants to split the bill. Um, and, and we use a lot, of, uh, a lot of phrases to explain this. So uh, I've heard, well done is better than well said. Uh, don't tell me, show me. Um, but there were two that I liked. One, this last summer, was the conclusion of the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. And in the first Batman of this trilogy, uh, Bruce Wayne is this playboy. He's Batman's alter ego, the non-Batman guy. And he's talking to his love interest, played by Katie Holmes. And uh, she doesn't approve of his lifestyle. And she says, and she thinks Bruce is a nice person, but questions his morals and essentially says to him, it's not who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. On a more serious note, um, Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in a South African prison uh, for opposing his government and wanting to end apartheid. And he would read the poem Invictus, and there was a movie about that. And the last two lines of the poem are now up on the floor. Uh, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Here's a guy who had every reason to complain about his situation, every reason to put blame elsewhere. Uh, but in order to survive, in order to continue moving forward, he had to realize that he was in control of his fate. He was in control of his emotions and how he's going to proceed going forward. And speaking of going forward, last year it was about building a platform. And we did that. We have, and we're in the works, we have Alpha Comedy, which is launched and growing and continuing, continuing to improve. We have uh, the, the broadcasting network with weekly shows that are building an audience. We have um, we've published multiple books, uh, ebooks. We've already completed one audiobook, and we're working on the second. We have plans for websites for our existing content. Now, this is just the uh, to use a, a, a business term, the low hanging fruit. We're opening the fridge, we're seeing what we have in there, and then we're making a meal with what we have in the fridge. We haven't even gone to the grocery store yet. Um, in terms of making a, making a new investment in a, in a super new business. The audio is sort of down that road, but we're still leveraging existing content to a large extent. And I think going forward, in order to make that jump, in order to actualize a lot of the stuff that we want to do, uh, we need to make a change. And there is, has anybody heard of the company Tough Mudder? Yeah. Yes. You have. Anthony, what, what, what is Tough Mudder? They run races that uh, are extreme races. It involves to going through this muddy obstacle course. There are electrified wires you have to crawl under. There are, there are uh, walls you have to climb over. You're in a team, and your entire, entire team has to make it through this you know, extremely challenging, brutal race and, and all sorts of tough conditions. That's right. So I saw, um, I saw an, and, and it's only been around for, I think, since 09, like a couple, even 2010, only a couple years. And I saw an interview with the CEO. He's a British guy. He was British Special Forces, Harvard Business School grad, and um, somebody was asking him about it. And he said, and the, the, the person who was asking, uh, it was, a, uh, I think, Reuters interview, and the, and the interviewer was saying, well, this is, you can copy this idea pretty easily. So the barriers to entry for a competitor are very low, and we've seen that. Spartan race is coming out, and there are some other competitors out there. And the, the founder of Tough Mudder, and their revenue has grown like a hockey stick. In three years, they're doing 30 million in revenue a year. He said, uh, it, they, they can't do what we can do. And the guy was like, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, when you, when you want to do an Ironman, you want to do an Ironman. You don't want to go 
swim and run and, and bike to set a random race. And the guy's like, I'm not following. And he said, we're a marketing company that puts on events. And that was a critical component for me. And that stood out in my mind. Here's a guy, I mean, the first thing Anthony says is they, they, they run races and they're extreme and all that stuff. But he didn't talk about any of that. He said, we're a marketing company. What does that have to do with running races? The, the, the answer is, it's not about the idea, it's about the team. It's about his group of people understanding, okay, how do we package that and market it and present it to the public in a way that's unique and different and feels different and branded, branded, branded in a specific <laughs> way uh, that they know and they only want to do Tough Mudder. It's the same thing with the gear that a lot of you are wearing. It's to make you feel a certain way. It's the same reason why the homepage is a certain way. It's to give you that sense of brand when you're associated with creators. I had a, I had a friend of mine who started a uh, shoe company called Teeks and they make foldable ballet flats with a blue bottom. And he was telling me about the shoe business. And he said, it's one of the most cutthroat businesses that there is. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the incumbents are ruthless. So if you are Tory Burch or Louis Vuitton or Nike, and they go to Nordstrom or Foot Locker, and some, some upstart competitor wants shelf space, the incumbent will say, if you're gonna carry those, you're not gonna get the limited edition Louis Vuittons. And they have that sort of negotiating power. So then the distributors have to <coughs> acquiesce to the, to the big name brands. Now what he said is his plan is to own Facebook in the sense of all of his marketing is done through Facebook and he'll own that demographic and they'll sell only through teeks.com, through his site. So why is that smart? Well, number one, he controls the marketing, the message through the new distribution platform, Facebook. And he doesn't need the Nordstroms and the uh, uh, Bloomingdale's and the different shoe distributors out there. Technology is not only disrupting media, it's disrupting every business out there in a good way. I love marketing, I love advertising. Um, can you pull up the first image? I remember when I was a kid, this is a, this is, you can tell this is a, 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 a a scam. I, I will never forget the first time I saw this ad. I was flipping through a Sports Illustrated and this ad was on here and I, I just stopped and I would stare at it for like hours and they have this phone number here which is not in service. Don't ask how I know that. Uh, they have this, <laughs> before, before the internet. <laughs> but they had this phone number out here and they got the shoe and you got the texture here with the shadow and, and, and it doesn't there's no ad copy it's a shoe with a phone number and but what it did was elicit this emotional response from me in terms of I got to know everything there is to know about this shoe and this is before Google uh, and how do I get it and when does it come out and you know everything um, and I still remember that, and it came out in 1996. Um, so as we go forward, you can get off. So, so as we go forward, thinking about the importance of marketing and the emotional impact that it can have on on you and on us and on our on our customers is is critical. And as we as we start to uh, continue to take food out of the fridge and make meals, but also go to the grocery store and start to do even newer businesses. Um, the important thing to ask ourselves is, do the dogs eat the dog food? Are people into it? Are they buying it? Are they going to the site? Is traffic increases? What are the trends? And if they're not, how do we pivot? How do we change course? How do we course correct? How do we do something differently? And most importantly, are we putting ourselves in a position to succeed by marketing it correctly? And maybe in that case, we have to course correct. Um, it, it was last year when I was reviewing the speech, a lot of it was getting buy-in for change and innovation. And when I reviewed the speech, I realized you guys did a great job because I don't have to do that anymore. 
I think everybody gets it. I remember during um, a speech yesterday, um, one of the presenters said, if, he was talking about capitalism, and, and he said, if, if companies don't innovate, then they die. And everybody gets that now. And, and I, I just love that sort of progress that we've made in the last year. And I think that in the next year going forward is how do we start to actualize results? And how do we uh, start to become a marketing company that produces content? That's the big change. So you pull up the last. Uh... So, Soul Cycle. Anybody done it? They're not out here, are they? They are. Not here. Not here. Yeah. Um, so, Soul Cycle is uh, it's spin class. Um, but you have to pay $30 to do it, and it's 45 minutes. Um, you sold yet? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what SoulCycle's been able to do is offer a product that is branded in such a unique way. It's not an incredibly innovative idea, but their marketing and their brand truly is innovative. Now at every Soul Cycle studio, this is up on the wall, and nobody's explained it to me, um, and I don't really care what the, what their meaning was, but this is how I interpret it. When I read this, I think about the question: How will you be remembered? What's your legacy? How do you want people to think about you? What's the first word that comes to mind? You can click off, and. And uh, I think that as we go through these new businesses and push forward uh, to the future and becoming a marketing company that does content production, what are the, externally, what are the first words that are come to mind when you think of Alpha Comedy or you think of XYZ New Business? Starting to get a sense of the emotional component of the consumer. And then bringing it back internally, full circle. What do my teammates say about me? How will I be remembered? What's my legacy here at Creators? That same uh, Jim Valvano, the same speech, so he, he won the basketball title in 83. Ten years later, he, he was diagnosed with cancer and he died. And he gave a very famous speech um, and in the speech, he said, uh, cancer can take away all my physical capabilities. It cannot touch my mind, it cannot touch my heart, and it cannot touch my soul. And the idea behind that is that the, the, it's not about him or this, this vessel. It's about what he does and, and the legacy that he leaves behind. And that's a very dramatic example. But Steve Jobs is saying the same thing of all this stuff and all these constructs that we've put in place are just arbitrary. It's about the team and it's about believing in each other and battling together towards a common goal. And the more that we can do that and the more that we can believe in each other and focus on becoming that marketing company that produce, produces content, the more success we're gonna have in the next 12 months. Thank you. Bob Gardner has asked if everyone could stay here so he could do a stage shot of this. So sure. let me go, let me go tell him. Have you done Soul Cycle? Once. Uh, I don't love it, but I understand the appeal. Yeah. Are the shoes intentional? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the start of your shoe? Fetish? Love. No. I got my first. Love? Those are the 11s. I, I got my first Jordans. They were the 7s. So four years before. Wow. I wore those shoes so much that there was a hole in the bottom and the air bubble came out. 
Because when you're a kid, you just have one pair of shoes. You just wear them all the time. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Funny, I was talking to I was talking to Sarah because um, her her roommate, their their company did come on in their, their company did a, a Harlem Shake video, and uh, I said what company they work for? She's like oh she works in advertising and, and she told me the name of the company, and I was like oh they did the Blake Griffin Kia ads, and uh, have you seen those? Uh, the Kia has, have people seen those? They're super funny, super creative. Um, ads. So that, I mean, just that, I mean, that is literally a marketing company, but that sort of uh, got me thinking of, oh, that's what a successful company does, you know, in terms of marketing and advertising. And they Harlem Shake at 10 a.m. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so starting every Monday. <laughs> that's kind of long been a joke that, you know, we're, you know, unbeknown to 99.9% .9 of the American public, but there's a 0.01% that thinks we're gods, thinks that we can make a cartoonist the next Charles Schulz, or thinks we can make an opinion columnist uh, the next thousand paper you know, opinion columnist. So the idea is to expand the creative brand so it's more than just that fraction of a percent. People know who we are outside of this small community. Makes sense to me. I love the analogy with the grocery store, the fridge and the grocery store, because there is so much there. There's so much to work with. the job, took another job, she's at Columbia Business School, and we still talk all the time, and she's like a mentee, and one of my, uh, I, I love her, um, and Lou uh, was fine, uh, sort of lost touch with her. <laughs> <laughs> Linda's a rock star, though. That's good. Anything else? Comments? I, I have a question. Yeah. Confidence, 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 confidence. I personally think it's back and forth. Like if you want to learn to drive, you know, the only way you really learn is to drive. And when, the more you drive, the more competent you are, then the more confident you are. Um, but on the other hand, it, it kind of goes hand in hand. I, I don't think one is, I think you need both. But you do definitely, the more competent you are, the more you build your confidence, the more successes yeah. you have. And I'm not. You know, I, I think that uh, the professor made it sort of black and white, and I do believe it's super gray. And I think that you get that, com the point was you get that confidence, you can get that confidence from somebody believing in you. Um, but yeah, you're right. Well, comments? contrary to what you think, I think you did a very good job. <laughs> 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 it's very He's super cynical and thinks everything's horrible. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, anything else? No? Okay. So uh, our 10.30 is here. So you have 19 minutes. Wait, I think Bob wants to get a few shots. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. A few stage shots. We're just having trouble finding a plug. That's okay. <laughs> um, so nice. We're going to have another event in 20 minutes. Oh, okay. But in here? So is everybody going to take a break? And yeah, but I don't know if they're, they're not going to be seated like this. If you, want, if you want to do some now, precious. Okay, is there, is there a closer plug? <laughs>